Good morning, friends. I wasn't in the auditorium class. We're helping out in the college class, but I like what I've heard so far about putting forth our best effort in worshiping God. That is a grand thought, and I'm so, so glad to see you. Like was stated, we have quite a few who are away and traveling, but it's good to know that all the cool people are still here, and I'm glad that you're present. I'm glad that we're all still here, and forever who may be listening online, we welcome you as well. I do want to say it's good to see Brother Darrell uh, with us today. I know he's been wanting to be back for some time now, and I'm thankful that the Lord has made that possible. And there are others, and we, we are so glad to see you. This morning, I want to talk about nothing. And... I can hear some of you right now saying that, well, you always do. You always say nothing. But I, I want to consider a thought that I think is intriguing about how often the Bible uses the term nothing in relation to various things that I believe can be a good platform for us to observe various thoughts in our relationship with God. And to get it going, for instance... I think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 about how the philosophies of men are going to come to nothing. That's how he words it. And he goes back really in, in quoting uh, from the Old Testament in emphasizing this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see that, that Paul is dealing with those who were rejecting the gospel. And the driving force behind that was these philosophies of men who felt like they knew more than the apostles, they knew more than God, they knew more than Christ, that they knew more about life than anything that these apostles would have to say. And Paul just basically steps back and says that people who really are wise are the people who understand the gospel and who obey the gospel. And he says that in contrast, those who cling to these doctrines and philosophies of men, they're going to come to nothing. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26 beginning. You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now you might read that at, at, at first glance and think, well, God doesn't have a very high estimation of Christians. Because he uses the terms weak and base and simple things. But he's contrasting that with the wisdom of men, that which is popular, that which is accepted, that which is believed by the masses in defiance of God. That's what he's getting at. But the simple people, the people who are humble and honest and the people who are willing to lower themselves, to be rejected by men, to receive God and to live for God. These are people who see it, who see the truth. And that was true in the first century when he wrote that, and it's true in our time. And it will be true as long as there is time. That the people who truly get it are people who are honest, who are willing to admit that we need someone beyond ourselves to have hope in life, and that the person who gives us the greatest hope is this Jesus, who was rejected by his time and is rejected even now, and his teaching is seemed as, as inferior to the wisdom of men. But as he points out, at, like in verse 28, that these things are going to come to nothing, these philosophies, he mentions in verse 19... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And that's true. And there are basically two ways that's going to be nothing. 
that the philosophies of men will be nothing really primarily in two ways. One, in relation to this world. And what we can see from that is the philosophies that were present in that culture that were rejecting Christ and the gospel, you don't even know the names of those philosophies now. Let alone the people who are espousing them and the people who are defending them, they're nothing. They're gone from this world. Their, their names are erased from time. They came to nothing in relation to this life. But that's especially true in a second sense, and that is spiritually in the next life. Don't you know that anybody who held to a philosophy that thought it was beneath them to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and clung to these philosophies instead, and if they left this world in that condition, don't you know that the very first moment that they were aware in eternity that they realized they believed a lie. They realized they had put their faith in the wrong thing. And that, that in relation to the gospel, they were nothing. Because now they understand this is what life is all about. In, in living for God and putting their faith in the Son of God. And so they, they became nothing. They became nothing. And we have to understand that's going to be true of every doctrine that Jesus has not planted, that's not of God, is going to become worthless one day. And it's any doctrine. It's not just the philosophies of rejecting Jesus. It's any doctrine that's not rooted in the Word of God is hopeless. I remember when I was asked to do the funeral of this one lady, and I did, I preached the funeral, but I didn't know this at the time, and as I was presenting the thoughts, especially the gospel, I didn't know that one of the siblings, one of the sisters of this lady, held to this idea that she had learned in a denomination that said that once you're saved, you're always saved. And I didn't know her family had tried to persuade her to see the truth against that. Well, in, in the lesson, I pointed out the gospel and how to be saved from sin and the importance of remaining faithful to the Lord. And after the lesson, this sibling comes up to me and she has a grin on her face and she says, great sermon. Well, most of it was great. And she had a big grin on her face and I... I I later learned what she was getting at. But yeah, it's all true, but that part about having to remain faithful, no, that's, that's, not, that's not really part of the truth. And despite her family's effort to try and persuade her to see that that's not what the Word of God says, that you do have to be faithful, you do have to take heed lest you fall, she's putting her faith in a doctrine that is rooted in the philosophies of men. And that's going to come to nothing. Anything not founded in the word of God is coming to nothing. And that's what we have to understand. Even error is going to be exposed one day. And so Paul is simply encouraging Christians with the truth to not lose heart. Don't be intimidated by the world. And it's philosophies that seem to be dominant at this time. Don't be intimidated. The people who are simple and the people who are honest will see the truth. And that will stand. We even sang that this morning. The kingdom of God is going to stand. And that's just true. But let's keep going with this thought on terms of nothing. And notice how the Bible teaches that you and I were created from nothing. That's how the Bible presents this. And there are several ways it says this. I like what it says in John chapter 1. It's a great thought of considering how our God made this world. But here's how he phrases it in John chapter 1 and verse 3, and then we'll see in Hebrews 11 and verse 3. But notice this. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Everything was made by God. Now, going back to the philosophies of men, you will have those who teach that we are the result of evolution. Richard Dawkins in his book, God Delusion, said evolution is a fact beyond reasonable doubt 
And that is certainly a popular philosophy in our time. But here's what Christianity and the evolutionists have in common. And that is both believe this came from nothing. And neither one can demonstrate it. And that's true. This did come from nothing. But the key is learning how it evolved. How did it all begin? That's the key to understanding the difference in the two philosophies. And the question is, which is more reasonable? That you had nothing and then automatically it just evolved on its own? Or you had nothing and a living being spoke it into existence? Which is more reasonable? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, God did this out of nothing. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So there was nothing. And he made it. And as a result, we have life here on earth. Which is more reasonable? That it just appeared or life comes from life? And I think we can all say that, that it's more reasonable to walk by faith in the Word of God. What if you went out your front door tomorrow and there on your step is a baby in a basket. It's wrapped up in a, a blanket and a baby's just sitting there on your front, front porch. Now if that were to happen, I'm sure you would have a few questions. Your question would be like, well, who, whose child is this? How did this baby get here? Who did this? Who dropped off this baby? But not a single person in the history of mankind would go down the path of saying, well, look, it just evolved. It just happened. The baby just happened. Out of nothing. It just, it just formed. Nobody would think that. We all know that it takes life to make life. That's the world we live in. And so when it comes to understanding that everything came from nothing, which is more reasonable? That it did it on its own or that it's a result of a living, intelligent, powerful creator? And the Bible says by faith we understand that God did this. A living person did this. That's the more reasonable approach to looking at life. And that's exactly how the Bible presents God, that he calls those things which do not exist as though they did in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. So we are here in this marvelous world with this magnificent body, with this tremendous mind, this powerful mind, an instrument God has given us to imagine things and to create things because a part of him is in us with our morality and it's all there because God is the source of life. But let me, let me insert this little thought, because this is a good thought as well. Because the Bible says, as I just quoted, that he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Don't you know that is true for all parts of life? He did this with this world. It wasn't here, and he spoke it in and made it real. But that's true in your life as well. Do you not realize there are opportunities not present in your life right now that God, God's going to bring into existence in your life? He has that ability. He has the ability to make something out of nothing. Those opportunities aren't there right now. Those relationships may not be present right now in your life. Those opportunities of employment, providing for your family, the opportunity for our family. The opportunity to share the gospel. Do you not realize that there are people not yet converted that are going to be converted as a result of your effort and God working through you? He can make something out of nothing. He's a God who leads and guides and, and helps us fulfill his purpose in life. But at the very base we see the most reasonable explanation is an intelligent person, a living person, is the germ of life. But he did this out of nothing. Let me keep going with this thought 
believe it or not, there's quite a bit in the Bible that says about this, but I'm only looking at a few. Another one is that we can lose our purpose. Our purpose can be nothing. And here's how Jesus presents this thought. In Matthew chapter 5, you will have Jesus reminding disciples to remain distinct and unique in this world. And whenever we lose that, whenever we're no longer willing to be different from the world where God is different, in morality and truth, in doctrine, in manner of life, then we are no longer distinct and we are certainly no longer fulfilling our purpose. We have become nothing is what Jesus says. And here's how he says it in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, some will hear this and they will question the teachings of Christ because how does salt lose its flavor? I mean, how can sodium not be sodium? And we understand that's impossible. Sodium is always sodium. It's impossible for it to be anything else. And so what was Jesus talking about? That if the salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. And what I believe he's getting back to is a common problem they had in his day and time. Where salt and sand look so much alike that people would mistake the two when they were mining for salt. One historian said in Jesus' day, there was no refining process for salt. Because you couldn't tell the difference between salt and sand, the salt one used was often a mix of salt and sand. If the mixture had more sand than salt, it had no flavor and was useless. And it was thrown out. It didn't, it didn't meet its purpose of preserving. But that's what salt does. Salt, yes, gives flavor, and, and yes, in a sense, your righteousness gives flavor to this world where God is more patient and endures because there are people here striving that were not completely like the generation of Noah that had just forgotten God, that were thinking of evil continually, and so God judged the world where you and I were to preserve it, were to make it more palatable to, palatable to God. To wait just a little bit longer because there are people still trying and still striving to live for him. But as we also know, salt preserves. And so you and I have the task of preserving holiness and righteousness and godliness. That's us. We have the task of defending Jesus' church in this world. The gospel in this world. That's our task. That's our job to be ambassadors of Christ, to be people who let our light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, if salt is blending in with the sand, if we're no longer distinct and we're, we're becoming just like the world around us in terms of morality or in terms of doctrine, not willing to be distinct for Christ, then it's useless. We've become nothing. There's no point, no purpose in our calling as God's people if we're not willing to be different where God is different. And so we avoid becoming nothing. And as a result, we just don't act like everybody else in the sense that we don't dress like everyone else or we don't talk like everyone else. We don't entertain ourselves like everyone else when those activities are in defiance of God's will or do not reflect God's will. Everything about us is to be a walking, breathing demonstration of the will of Christ. And if we're not willing to do that, then we are useless. We are good for nothing. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says this, and encouraging us to remain distinct. In Ephesians 5, it says, beginning in verse 8, you were once darkness... But now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather, expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. 
Hello? I mean, that's very clear language. You know, we can't be like everyone else around us in morality. We have to be different and distinct, and we have to be willing to stand where God stands. And that's going to require some persecution. But our purpose, our purpose can be nothing if we're not careful. Well, again, there's a thousand ways we can look at this thought. Let me say one last thing about nothing. And that is, and it's a very common one you've heard a million times, and you're about to hear it a million and one, because it's just so important. When it comes to nothing, good friends, you are taking nothing with you. And the Bible does its best to remind us of this. It is so important that we hear this from time to time that we need a wake-up call and realize there's no point in getting caught up in this world and in betraying people for things in this world or betraying our God for things in this world. That's pointless. It's vain. It's like trying to grab the wind. It's pointless because you came with nothing and you're leaving with nothing. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible says in verses 6 through 8, in talking about not wanting this world more than God, he says that godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. I'll just read verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Is there any other verse that describes our world so well as verse 9? People selling their souls for material things. And the vanity is you, you, brought not, you, you cannot carry anything out. What a very vivid concept. You cannot carry anything out. You came here empty-handed with an eternal soul. That's what you came with. And you're going to leave with that eternal soul. You're not even going to keep this. This thing returns to dust. But the Spirit returns to the one who gave it for accountability. You keep nothing. You don't get to hold on to anything in this life. Not even the carcass that you possess. Nothing. We leave with nothing. And since that's the case, why would I focus on this more than God. Why would I make this world my God? But I can tell you, and you know as well as I do, that's easier said than done. But we need to be reminded of this. So yeah, I went up to see my father in Illinois um, recently, and he took me to the small farming community he grew up in and was from. And we're in this town of 600 now, a very small town. And we were driving, and I was able to take some photos of the fields. I mean, it's just farmland, beautiful farmland. And it has, a, it has a, a certain charm to it. But as we were coming back from that small town, we stopped at the cemetery where a lot of the people from that community or people he knew, even relatives, were buried. And he was showing me the, the marker of his mom's grave who passed away when I was seven uh, and other relatives and then he was showing he was amazed by how many people he knew in that graveyard and he was going down the list well hey she used to own the feed mill she was great to do business with he goes uh, well this this guy here he used to sell cars in the community and he would cheat you if he could and he would talk about that. And he says, well, this guy right here, he and I played ball together, and then we both went into the service together. And he was just going down the list of looking at all the various people who are, are there, whose bodies are there. And then I took photos of other things that I saw that I thought were really interesting about how you had uh, this marker here that right there that supposedly... These were important people, but, I mean, look at all the, the, the grass clippings that cover the marker. That one marker right there is so old that the names have been erased through time. And then I saw this guy right here, a Mr. James Thomas, 
right there. And what do you know? My first name is James. You know, and you see something like that. You know, you see your own name marked there. And then how even time is erasing that. Time has a way of wiping this all away. Those people's presence in this world is over. And now even their name is being erased from time. That's coming to all of us. What's the point? And so he says, with food and clothing and with God, that's great gain. Walking with God, living with God, taking each moment to express love for God, that's what life is all about. Because we certainly cannot put our faith in this world. I have to read Psalm 49 in wrapping this up. Psalm 49. Because this is a message that God has been trying to tell people for a very long time. In Psalm 49, it says this beginning in verse 16. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. So the animals and I, you and I and the animals have something in common. We all borrow breath from God. We're all here but for a moment. And so I share these thoughts with us good friends. Hopefully something has been said to remind us of what it's all about. The philosophies of men are coming to nothing. God created us from nothing. We can become nothing if we're no longer salt. And then, of course, we can carry nothing with us. But you know, there's one other thing we need to know about as I extend the invitation to you. And that is, you can hide nothing from God. We're all naked before him. Or as it says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 26, there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. That's true. Our God knows us. And so since he knows us, why not respond to him in humility and trust and obedience? That's why you're here. That's the point of life is to fear God and keep his commandments. And if you realize you haven't been living with him, well, why not now? What a beautiful day to be saved from sin. Beautiful day. By putting your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, confessing that faith, turning away from every sin you know of, and then being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that's when you enter the body of Christ. Galatians 3.27, you're baptized into Christ. And so we hope you will do that today. If you have done that but need to make things right with God in a public way, come to Him as we stand and sing.